Welcome to Mentoring Moments. Mentoring Moments is a sub-series of the E-Commerce Edge podcast. It is composed of clips taken from Jason's one-to-one and group mentorship sessions. So what have you got going on in, uh, in your world at the moment? Right now, basically, in regards to, let's say, business part of my career, I joined Vimo almost a year ago, working mostly on a dock market, really into GTM over there and everything connected with docs, so partnership ecosystem, vendor partner ecosystem and all that. So I, I was really, I like the way you speak about some very interesting topics that are very close to my heart. I like the way that you don't like generalization. That's one of the things that is, I'd say, a rare thing today because like hype wagon is a very strong thing these days and yes. they uh, yeah it's gonna work for all of you yeah it, certainly yeah <laughs> in some yeah. outer space and universe so a uh, the reason why i got included here is that exactly as i said i like the way you speak about some things and i was like yeah i saw that this mentoring sessions are going to be for the people that are not exactly the profile i am so i want to talk with people i want to hear what people that i'm targeting what they're thinking about what how they how do you think about the topics that are close to us? When I say close to us, I'm talking about service, a company that is providing basically e services, being Vimo. And then to see how I can better understand people. I guess that's the thing because imposing technology over people is never a good idea. It first needs to be people, what it means to them, how it solves problems for them, and ideally how we can help with that. And then comes the technology, but that's the second thing I say, or a third one. Couldn't agree more. And you, you obviously, because you've been at Devante, you've been, you've been in the ecosystem for a while now. This is definitely not your first rodeo. But if we think yep. about Vimo, you're effectively an e-commerce agency, right? That's what you guys deliver. You deliver e-commerce exactly. solutions exactly. on the yep. Adobe Commerce slash Magento platform primarily. We are working with Adobe Commerce slash Magento and Commerce Tools as well. And they also a selection of, let's say, notable composable technologies such as a uh, basically everything in the let's say in that ecosystem we are able to cover but when i say everything i'm thinking about every piece of the puzzle but we don't work with a lot of partners right now view storefront as a let's say sorry i need to change lanes okay view storefront and fantastic in regards to front front end technologies also we're talking about contentful we're talking about a acneo for pem also some other relevant technology. So we are able to cover, I'd say in regards to digital systems, every link of that value chain are covered. Sure. PIM, CDP, front end, yep. back end, yep. content. Yep, exactly. So the co- commerce and then obviously systems integrations to things like ERPs, CRMs, et cetera. Exactly. Yes, exactly. I'd say the, that ERP is probably the only thing that we do not provide. It's a, It's an ecosystem of itself, but we are like, working with the partners that are able to do that. Everything else, yes. Makes sense. Makes sense. Yeah. And what are you finding? Are you finding, I I think that as the global economy starts to contract and budgets contract for digital and e-commerce projects, at least from what I'm seeing and what I'm hearing from the market is that in particular, a lot of the headless projects have been put on hold or delayed or cut back in scale and scope in favor of more monolithic projects, just because as budgets contract, we all know that a headless implementation is tends to be, or the time to value tends to be expend, extended by around 50% or more. Budget tends to be increased by 50% or more. And as a result of that, and the complexity is higher and the skill set of the merchant has to be higher. They tend to have to have better internal resourcing, whether that means having internal developers or at least a strong IT team that can guide the developers. Because look, the reality is that as of now, Headless is still pretty nascent. It's still it's still at a place where I would still consider it vastly immature for the most part. And therefore it's still expensive, still time consuming and in terms of long-term maintenance costs and TCO, it's absolutely without question going to be more expensive than a monolithic deployment. And so what I'm seeing in the market is marketers in particular in the D2C and B2C space are expected to do more with less. And as a result of that, a lot of these headless projects are being pared back or ditched in favor of a monolithic deployment just with the uncertainty in the market. Are you seeing the same thing or are you seeing people just going full speed ahead with headless? So when we are talking about a bigger, some of the bigger clients that we have, where obviously the discussions have started much, much earlier prior the, let's say the downturn that is happening and that is about to happen with them, we don't see a big change in that regard, because obviously those are plans that have been put in place quite some time ago. 
But when we are talking about the new clients, new leads, that there is a bit of hesitation, but it's not just connected with headless. It's, it's not just connected with headless. It's connected with, let's say, everything all together. There is a tendency on the side of clients to actually look at the, generally the tech stack that they have and basically trying to make sure that they do not overinvest or let's say rather they'll go into making sure that, that the proven tech stack that they have, the thing that is actually creating value that they continue on that and expand on that. And actually to even cut down on the elements of stack that they are currently using that is not making some direct or let's say very pronounced contribution to the business model altogether. So I think it's not necessarily connected directly with headless, but I say generally with technology. So that is actually definitely apparent. Even when we talk with our vendor partners, they're seeing the same thing basically. Yeah, I'm absolutely seeing the same thing. And I think that you hit the nail on the head in terms of merchants wanting to make sure that they have the internal resources that they need to leverage the technology that they already have. And if they don't have those resources, yep. then one of two things has to happen. They either have to realign internal resources against the tech stack they've got, or they have to start eliminating things from the tech stack that they're not using. One of, one of the two. And exactly. either, either one of those two things is a little bit painful in that if you're looking at internal resourcing, then that usually requires taking on some additional cost there if you don't have mm -hmm. the appropriate resources or at least reallocating resources to the correct place within the... And then obviously when you start removing components from the tech stack, that's never easy either because then you have to figure out, okay, if I pull this, if I unplug this piece, what does it do to the rest of my stack? Where does data flow? Where does it need to flow? Where is key product data going to come from? Where is key customer data going to come from? Where is my key segmentation and remarketing technology going to sit? Is it going to be a CDP or is it just going to be a marketing automation platform instead? So there's a lot of hard decisions. There's going to be some crunch times yeah. happening yeah. right now across a whole wide swathe of merchants. And I'm even seeing it in the B2B space because I service a lot of B2B merchants that are either D2C today and trying to add a B2B channel to help de-risk their business, or they're B2B today and they're trying to add a D2C channel to get closer to their customers and get the feedback uh, loop going and have a little bit higher level of ownership directly with their customers. And so I'm seeing migrations both directions and adding of channels, increasing the channel mix, but I'm also seeing an exact situation where even new implementations on a B2B platform where they're going, hey, do we actually need these five pieces in the tech stack or can we get away with yeah. two pieces? And so a lot of hard discussions but I think that they're, in most cases, they're very smart discussions that are happening and brands are being pretty realistic about their own capabilities. And they're saying, hey, we can implement, yep. we could buy a Ferrari, but do we have the drivers and do we have the, do we have the mechanics and do we have all the team that we need to actually be able to race this Ferrari or don't we? So I think exactly. there's, a lot, there's a lot more practicality re-entering the market is what I'm seeing versus say even six, nine months ago, there was still, it was still, the market was still pretty heady. It was still pretty frothy. People were still throwing money at things that may or may not provide ROI to the business just because they had capital to burn when they were trying to get one leg up on their competitors. Whereas now there's definitely a much, much more practicality in the market. And I think that's a, yep. I don't see that as a bad thing. I actually see that as a very good thing. I'd agree on that because at the point when we are starting to think about things in, in let's say in digits, making sure that we weigh everything that we have on the table, that's putting all of us, both clients and us in a better situation. And they, I definitely say it's a, it's a good thing. What I'm, when I'm looking at the, today at clients, potential clients, generally at companies, brands, they are in a tricky situation. Just imagine you started with a very good plan. Let's say you, you did two or three year plan. You have a very good plan in regards to technologies and so on. And like you want to bring in new services, we, we want to expand and so on. And all of a sudden you have like this downturn that is about to happen. How big is it going to be? Let's see. But you're in a situation where you absolutely need to decide whether you continue with these three initiatives or not. And they might be so early in the stage of starting that you're just like, but it could have brought us something, but now we will never know. So it's really hard for them because like you, you planned, you invested already. And in a quite of a few of those situations, you even brought on people on board. So it's not an easy time for them. It's really tricky. It is. I think what brands are trying to do better today than they were over the last couple of years of this frothy market is they're really trying to look at the channels that are performing today. And they're really trying to double down on that. And they're really trying to go all in on the experiential mm -hmm. side of those channels that are working. Is it, and they're trying to understand those channels better because in a traditional omni-channel business where maybe a brand only had 
let's say they had an ERP, let's say they had a CRM for <clears throat> the operational side of the business and for customer support and returns and the operational transactional side of the business, but they were trying to leverage it almost like a CDP, which we know CRMs are not CDPs. They're operational. They're not marketing in nature unless they've been configured that way. And so brands that maybe had just a marketing automation platform, maybe like a Clavio or something like that, and they're trying to understand the omni-channel behavior of their customers across all channels, including whether that be they sell through marketplaces, they sell through their own website, they sell through physical retail, they sell through partners as a reseller channel or a wholesale channel. They're trying to get much better insights into the performance of their customers, particularly the marketing channels of today for around acquisition are expensive and getting more expensive by the day. They're also, they don't want to be at the mercy of these other third-party platforms for their data, for their customer data. And they want to understand, okay, if this customer shops uh, if they shop directly through my website, if they shop in my physical store, plus they shop with me through a marketplace, okay, or if they, let's say they shop with two or three physical locations with me, <clears throat> I want to know where they perform the best and why. And I also want to exactly. incent them to continue to purchase through those channels. So if they spend, if their AOV online and the purchase for, their repurchase frequency is higher online and their return rates are lower online, then obviously we want to incentivize them to buy online. If it's in one of the three stores that they bought through, let's try to figure out why they spend more in one of our stores versus our other stores. Is it because the salespeople are better trained? Is it because they care more? Is it because the location is closer to their house? Is it because there's any one of a number of reasons why a customer will perform better in one channel versus another? But you can't operationalize those wins unless you understand what's causing those wins in the first place. And so I think a lot of brands are getting smarter about instead of just throwing all their money at acquisition and saying, let's not worry about retention. Let's not worry about lifetime value. Let's not worry about the customer experience because we can go out cheaply and consistently acquire new customers. I think they realize that's not the case, especially now. And so they're going to have to do more with less and they're going to have to treat customers with more respect. And what I'm saying is, also, a mindset starting very slowly, starting to seep into B2C and D2C, which has been normal for B2B for millennia, which is that conversations in the B2B space between the brand, the retailer, and their customer are the norm, that those relationships are the norm. They're having conversations with their customers every single day. They know their customers very well. They have very mm -hmm. long-term relationships with their customers. And in B2C, D2C, I don't know too many B2C, D2C marketers that are ringing up their customers on a routine basis, and they've operationalized outreach to their existing customers, both good and bad customers, meaning customers that have only ever bought once versus their VIP customers that have bought over a long period of time. There's almost a fear by a lot of B2C, D2C merch uh, and their marketers. There's almost a fear to actually have one-on-one -on -one conversations with customers. They'd rather go through a layer of MarTech and ad tech to go out and target and have, try to have one-on-one -on -one conversations with their customers via email or SMS or God mm -hmm. forbid, direct mail. And I think that mentality is going to have to change for brands to stand out in the minds of their customers. They're actually going to have to care, not fake care, but really care. And they're actually going to have to start having real conversations with their customers, literal conversations, like on the yep. telephone. I don't, I can't remember any retailer that I've bought off of. I can't remember a single one that is actually, even if I was a long-term customer of that brand, I can't remember a single time they picked up the phone and called me with the exception of brands where they're delivering to my door and their delivery person is calling up to make sure that I'm home for my delivery. So I think these conversations, these one-to-one -one conversations that seemingly are unscalable, if you've got less business because the market is contracting, well, now you've got more time to have real conversations with your customers and to stand exactly. out in their mind as somebody who gives a shit. So I think, the, I think these kind of conversations are going to become much more normalized in the B2C, D2C space, and they won't be the exclusive domain of B2B forever. Couldn't agree more. It's all about the context, starting from what you first said, like why this guy bought at the store number three. It's the context we want to know about and how to get to that, how to get that piece of context. Well, exactly as you said, talking with the people and getting to literally be on their radar. As you said, I also barely remember any of the companies that it's you buy because of this, because of that, they're going to deliver tomorrow. Okay, sure. Review, yeah, it's fine. It's all good. But I can say that five different things from the same category, I bought from three retailers. And like, why wouldn't I buy it from that that first guy? Because they didn't, they, I have no feelings towards them, like nothing. And the thing is, there is one thing that is very, it's super simple and super easy. 
Today, if you want to buy something, you're going to spend that money because you decide there's no way in hell you're going to check like five retailers. No, I don't like these guys. I'm not going to buy this. No, you're going to look for the for the sixth one, for the seventh, and you're going to buy it eventually. But what people want to see that somebody cares. It's it's just that thing that just show me a little bit of appreciation. That's it. Now, I had it recently and it was a ridiculous situation, I swear. It's just like really ridiculous. I'm actually based out of Croatia. Obviously, over here, I know in, in, in Southeastern Europe, I'd say I know every bigger retailer and like companies that work with them, development companies and so on. So I'm like, I went, I wanted to buy a sink. Basically, something happened with the sink. And I was like, wife is like, we need to get a new sink. What do you want to have? Well, something like this. Oh, this is some kind of a fake stone. It looks really good. It's this and that. Super. Let's get that. I first check what I want to get. And they like, in terms of what's very easy to maintain and so on. Anyways. I went to check that on like the major retailer site. First of all, it was like really stupid site, navigation, ridiculous, of course, you know how it is. And I didn't have time to even check it anymore. Obviously, two days after that, I get some guys ad and I'm like, who are these guys? It's just like this, this, I've never heard of these guys. But there was something, I can't remember what was it. The ad was really nicely placed. Like it really, it caught my attention. Anyways, I bought it from the guys and all that. And they called me after it was delivered, three days after that. They called me to ask me whether the delivery was on time and how satisfied was I was with the service. I'm like, I've never had that. Never. And these guys are a small company. They've been working for two years. I guess they, when I compare them to these retailers here that are doing the same thing in the same space, I think they have, I don't know, like maybe 2% of the market. I'm not exaggerating, maybe 2%. Funny thing, I'm like, yeah, but absolutely, thank you. It was amazing. They're like, would you be okay to, to, to put like a review on our website? I'm like, yeah, sure, not a problem, really. Five days out, a couple of weeks after that, something happened with the handle on this on this sink, on this, I don't know what's the name of it. And they, uh, the color still decided to peel. Oh, yeah. I, I called them. They said, no, not a problem. Can you just shoot us a photo of that? I just shot a photo. Sure, not a problem. Two days after that, they deliver another handle to me. I'm like, that's it. I'm like, I've never seen this. Same thing, three days after that. How satisfied were you? We know that you had a problem with this and that. And so that, what they did for me and what they did for themselves, I'm not buying anything from the category that they, that I, that they are able to supply products from. I'm not buying from anybody else. There's no way in hell. I don't care how big they are. And these guys, I'm telling you, they own like maybe one or 2% of the market here. So that's what they did. Yeah. And basically, that's exactly what I think they should aim for. Because right now, I've been asked by two guys, oh, I've been getting this and that I need to get. I'm like, hey, they, these are the guys you want to talk to. So this is, we are doing some renovation. Talk to these guys. They do what they say and they do it like properly. So they got me. And then I think maybe they got one or two more additional guys with, not, with nothing, two calls, two phone calls. That's it. Two yeah. minutes. There you go. Uh, I was just going to say, each phone call was probably l less than five minutes per phone call. So definitely exactly. less than 10 minutes in total time. And yep. what I think is that if brands can operationalize customer service and mobilize customer service in customer service downtime, because customer service staff, they're not busy 100% of the time. They're not taking phone calls and live chats and emails yep. and everything else 100% of the time. They always have elements of downtime. So why wouldn't you want to mobilize your customer service people as evangelists for your brand? Why wouldn't you want to operationalize them to do customer outreach, to do customer love, to have customer mm -hmm. conversations? Because they're the best place to be having these kind of conversations, to be capturing information and to be feeding it back to sales, marketing, rev ops, the procurement, et cetera. Yep. They are the nexus. They are the linchpin of your business. So why wouldn't you want to operationalize them instead of just being the ambulance at the bottom of the cliff? Why wouldn't you want them to be a proactive component of customer love in your business? And so it sounds like that's what these guys do. And it's very rare to see. It's exceptionally yes, it <laughs> rare. And it's too rare. And it shouldn't be rare because the reality is that if you, it's far cheaper and far easier to keep an existing customer happy than it is to yep. go out and acquire a new one. So why wouldn't you want to put at least as much effort, time, care, and love into retention and customer happiness as you do customer acquisition? But a lot of brands don't see it. Yep. That they see customer service as a cost center, not as a potential profit center in the business. And I think it's, I think it's totally backwards because the reality is when somebody rings up, particularly pre-purchase, 
the likelihood that they will convert if they have a fantastic customer service experience is significantly higher. I, I remember when we were, when I was helping run e for one of, in fact, it was the largest online retailer of natural health products in New Zealand. Customer mm-hmm. service, the conversion rate for calls that came in pre-purchase, whether it be call, whether it be email, whether it be live chat, it was something like, it was ridiculous. It was in the 80 percentile range of conversion for people that contacted customer service. So the reality is, because they tracked all that, the reality is, oh my God, if you knew what the, you, let's say your average conversion rate is 2%, 3%, at the high end, maybe 4% or 5% if you're a really high yeah. end. You know, the reality is if you could have a channel that converted at 80 plus percent and you didn't, so let's say I was talking to a marketer and I didn't tell them what the channel was, but that I said, I've got a channel for you that is going to convert in excess of 80% consistently over time. Is that a channel you would be interested in? And you didn't tell them what that channel was. They would be all over it. They would be, they would do it, be doing backflips to do that, particularly if you could show them the ROI on that channel spend. But the problem is that marketers do not usually see customer service as an operational and transactional channel. Yeah. They, they don't see it. Yep. They see it purely as a cost center, a necessary evil part of doing business, as opposed to saying, hey, this is actually a place where we can make a lasting, happy impression with our customers, and they should be leveraging it in that way. And unfortunately, businesses I'm still seeing today are extremely siloed in the way that they operate. Customer mm. service is incented on how they are incented on time to first response usually they are yeah. also they're also incentivized on the number of communications that happens before they can close off and resolve a ticket CRM or in their customer service platform like gorgeous so they're incentivized to actually make the communication as short and compact and as almost curt as possible so that they re- they hit their KPIs are wrong in my opinion their KPIs are but completely the- wrong Yep, exactly. Because what you just said, the KPIs in this situation defeats the purpose of actually knowing the client and appealing to them. So it's just- Correct. 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 I think that a lot of brands are going to have to revisit. A, they're going to have to revisit how they operate <clears throat> cross-functionally in the business, and they're going to have shared KPIs. For example, mm. I don't know any yep. e-commerce manager that can move the needle in a business if three quarters of a catalog are out of stock continuously, you're, ne- you're never gonna you're never gonna be able to increase conversion. But very rarely is procurement and ecom KPI'd universally. Very rarely do I see it. They should be KPI'd jointly because I, as an e-commerce manager, for example, without the help of procurement to make sure that the average in stock. Yep a rate across my catalog, I have no control over that. Procurement is responsible for that, right? And so unless I'm working with procurement and I'm running reports on the rolling availability percentage on a monthly basis, at least to say, okay, over this month, 85% of our catalog was available at all times. Unless we're running those kinds of reports out of our ERP or our data visualization dashboard or wherever Mm. we're doing it, unless I'm doing that, I won't necessarily even know that is impacting my conversion rate on my website, but it absolutely is. Yep. So in, so unless I'm running reports and I'm saying, okay, I want to look at my conversion rate versus catalog availability, unless I'm running those and I'm charting those and I'm graphing those over time, every single time I've worked with a brand to chart this, there has been a direct correlation between catalog availability and conversion rate. Catalog, catalog availability goes down, conversion rate goes down. Catalog availability goes up, conversion rate goes up. Now that makes sense. If yep. I think of the if I think of simple buying psychology of my own, if I go to a website and I'm trying to buy say five things, I'm trying to buy them all in one place for convenience sake so that I hit the free mm-hmm. shipping threshold etc cetera, etc cetera, etc cetera, and in one website three out of the five items are out of stock, then I'm usually going to abandon my cart. If I go to another website, even though I may have to pay a little bit more per item for that, but they have all five items in stock for convenience and all the other things for my loyalty points and all blah, 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 all the other things that I get the benefit of paying a little bit more per item, but the total benefit to me as a consumer is higher. And I get the Mm -hmm. convenience of getting all my stuff at one time and I get it delivered at the same time, et cetera. I will buy at the place that has those products every single time. And most customers the same, even if it's only two items in a cart and one's out of stock, one's in stock, the exasperation that people feel when something's out of stock is phenomenal. And every single piece of market research that I've both performed and studied, out of stocks are one of the most frustrating things that you can have with your customers that will cause them to not only abandon their cart, 
but abandon you as a brand. And so these are the kinds of conversations that customer service can be having with, and frankly, marketers should be having, and e-commerce managers should be having with customers. But the only way that you solve for this is to cross KPI your teams, because no Mm -hmm. one team and no one person in the business can pull all the levers themselves. It's impossible. They all have to be empowered to fix these problems together, jointly. So very interesting conversation, but I think brands need to just have a little bit more empathy for the consumers and think like a consumer instead of thinking like a brand who's trying to shove yep. things down the throat of their consumers. Very just, think how, just think how they behave in their own daily life. Just think how brands exactly. make them, them feel in their own daily life. Think about the brands that make them feel amazing versus the brands that make them feel like an expendable number. We know, not, no human likes to feel like an expendable num- number that could be replaced. Exactly. Oh, it's uh, As soon as you make it very transactional, apparently it is like that in a lot of situations. That's exactly what you're getting out of your clients. Let's say clients. That's a transaction. There's nothing beyond that transaction. And once you've been served, you got that money, you got that small item, let's say small ticket item in your purse. But what's behind, what's happening after that? Nothing because it's just transaction. And there was one also one thing, one interesting thing. When I spoke, I spoke with a previous that had some, let's say, on the side engagements when it comes when it comes to consultancy. And I've had a discussion with the guy that was actually also he's actually doing a brand here. He has a brand here in Croatia, and they they definitely try to have a little bit of a let's say better customer service in regards to having a people that were, that would be first of all willing to do this kind of service, second of all be very well equipped to do that. And the third of all, or maybe the first thing, be long enough in the company to be able to do that. So the problem was that a lot of them, even this guy, he was willing to do that. But when I discussed with him and with some others, like the median tenure of the people over there that were working in customer service was ridiculously low. It was just like really low because they were getting either students, they were getting people that were between kind of some kind of jobs and all that. I'm like, yeah, but that's not what you would do in Guess what? B2B. Why? Because you're selling a hydraulic pump and you got to have a guy that's going to be able to talk about that. This is going to be able to tell a guy why it makes sense for him to get it in a technical manner. And then also everything that ha- that happens after the sale has been landed. What we're going to do for you, what we can do for you, what additionally we can. Um, and he's yeah, but we don't like, that's exactly, you're trying to find an excuse. Yeah, we have a guy that's been with us for six months and he's probably going to be here for, the maximum additional six months, and that's it, he's gonna go. And that turned out to be a big problem when I was speaking with this guy that has his brand, that most of his, most of his guys in customer service and the other guys that I spoke to in their customer service departments, most of the guys were really over there for not a long time. And that's very different from B2C compared to B2B customer services. That was like very pronounced. That's what I've seen. That's why I think even changing the the titles and the mission and the purpose and the KPIs, everything around customer service has to change. They need to become more like AEs in the B2B world, account executives, SDRs, SDMs. They're salespeople, right? In In the B2B world, they are salespeople. They are account executives. They're account managers. They are there specifically to basically hold the customer's hand and make them feel like gold. And I exactly. feel like customer service in B2C, D2C needs to be reorientated and re-incentivized in exactly the same way. And with modern technology, we can see exactly what the conversion rate of each person who works in that team is because we're now tracking all of their inbound inquiries through things like Gorgeous or a CRM, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. And we now know, we can now see, we can now link within a week or two days or whatever it is, if that customer converts, what they convert with, what the item, they can track the items that they were actually speaking to the customer mm-hmm. about. They can actually create a draft cart for them directly from those platforms. They can actually see what was in the cart when the c- customer reached out to customer service, say, for example, via live chat. So the data is there. The ability to track the performance of customer service and customer success or customer happiness Mm -hmm. people, the ability to track their performance is there like never before. We're just KPIing the wrong behaviors by those people. We're trying to keep their contact (laughs) and their number of contacts with the customer as short and infrequent as possible. We're actually, we should be tracking the outcomes, not the outputs. And that's the problem with customer service today. Yep. Yep. Couldn't agree more. 
I spoke with a friend of mine who actually here in Croatia runs one of one of T-Mobile's uh, call centers. I think they have in this one that the friend is running, I think they have 220, 230 people and so on. And I said, man, like, why do your people, and every time I need to have some discussion and so on, how come I always stumble upon people that have really been in a company for some really short amount of time and you don't necessarily have like people that have been with you for like really a long time and are able to cater for the needs of, let's say, complex customers. He said, like, exactly as we said at the beginning, man, it's very transactional here. It's very transactional. Today you are with us. We sold you some subscription. You paid for it, I don't know, like 20, 25 euros, 30 or something, and you're gone. I'm like, yeah, but that's exactly what's different in our world. So that works for them. For them, it's okay. It's not a problem because guess what? Today I sign up for you to go with your telecom agency. Tomorrow, you haven't managed to deliver exactly what was in the contract. And I'm totally allowed to just tell you. Sure. Go, and I'm off. Yeah, exactly. And you're done. Now, that's exactly what they are doing. And in their sense, in their world, it makes sense because it, it is very transactional. They don't really care about these kind of clients that we need to cater for. That's mm -hmm. exactly why we can't have the same behavior here and there. It just doesn't work like that. It makes no sense whatsoever. Couldn't agree more. Their cost of acquisition is low because all they've got to do is run a promotion that ends up on a billboard or yes. ends up online somewhere with some ad that they chase and they retarget you. And if it's a better deal than their nearest competitor, then you're probably going to make the jump because there's low friction. There's low, exactly. there's low conversion friction. Whereas in the retail world and particularly the B2B world, there's such an associated with supplier switching that you don't do it unless you absolutely have to. Yep. And I think it's worthwhile. The investment is so much more worthwhile in most verticals, not all verticals, but in most verticals, the investment for the long term is so worthwhile. And you've already got resources. The reality is you're already spending. You're already spending on yep. customer service people. You're already spending to acquire customers. You're already spending for marketing. You're already spending in all these areas of your business. Why wouldn't you want to leverage those resources more broadly to create a better customer experience that's more memorable in the customer's mind. Because at the end of the day, I hear a lot of marketers talking about demand generation. We're going to create demand or we're going to create leads. No, what you're trying to do is create desire. You're trying to actually create some sort of emotional connection with your customer because customers for the most part are not rational. Humans are not rational. We buy things for lots of psychological motivations that we don't even understand ourselves. And most of it has to do with desire for people from our friends, desire for, to, to fit in with society. Desire, there's all sorts of desires there yep. that, 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 that are motivated by emotion, not by logic. And so marketers would do well to understand those emotional triggers that cause people to want to buy. And if we can tap into those emotional triggers, not in some sort of sly, dirty sort of a way, but if we can make people feel good when they transact with us, then they're more likely to want to feel good again in the future and transact with us again in the future. So it's about how do we make them feel good to generate a desire as opposed to a transactional demand. That's where I land on this subject. Absolutely. I think it's all about experience. And basically everybody's saying that then it's been overused since always, but like it really is about experience in not just using the product that you bought. It's just like having that, 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 that sort of feeling that you've not been used, you've not been kind of almost exhorted for, extorted. for, for a certain extorted for a certain sum of money. It just, yeah, basically I, I almost gave my money away and I wanted to do that. And like, I feel really good about that. And I know that these people, like they somehow it feels like they care about me. So it's, yeah, it is transactional, but we don't have to apparently make it like very super obvious. So that's, yes, yes. that's the point. That's the point. And they, honestly, we, we, we've been doing, when it comes to the, to the brand altogether, brand of Vimo and all that, we've been reimagining it, it lately a little bit because they, we are in a good place on all the markets where we worked and we are, we are really happy where we are and so on. But then we started discussing more about experience. What does that actually mean? What does that mean to the people that we work with? So let's leave out like just this transaction, like our clients sold something or we sold them a web shop and all that. Let's not talk just about that. Let's talk about what's the experience that we have on our end. What's the knowledge that we have? What's the knowledge that the people on our end have? So yes, you are going to pay us for the website that we're going to build for you, obviously. But this is what we are giving you in return. It's like a huge experience. It's processes that are hard. It's like all of these things. The other thing, like again, experience, like 
we want to we want your team to see how you are going to feel working directly with our teams because we did a very good job putting up like preparing these teams making sure that the setup is like really proper that it's really it's not just like the money just forget about the money let's talk about the experience that your internal team is going to have with us we care about that that's all about experience so i'm just translating it a little bit into our business that we have here and just experience it just it's the substance the most important thing i would say all together and they, when clients have a feeling that his experience is in, in most of the domains very good with us, I think we are onto something. But it's a very it's a very fluid thing. It's a thing that you need to invest in every single day to make sure that you just take the path with your client and you just make them happy. And everything goes well after that. But it's continuous investment, I'd say. The big challenge, particularly in service industries, and I've run agencies before, so I know exactly the pain and the challenge and the frustration, but also the fun uh, and the opportunity associated with running a successful agency. And I think that the biggest challenge is that your customer's last touch point or last experience with you becomes that lasting impression. And so even if they're, let's say they're talking with a tech lead, or let's say they're talking with a dev, or let's say they're talking with an account manager, whatever it might be, the last experience they had with you is the one that leaves the taste in their mouth, right? And unfortunately, a lot of times it's hard to convey. If you're a developer, and I've worked with developers for many, many years, they're aliens, right? They're awesome at what they do, but they oftentimes are, well. are not comfortable. They're not comfortable in customer-facing roles. But now, yep. in the new world, every single person in the business is expected to be customer-facing at some point or another. That's the challenge. And yep. you, you can try to put buffers in between. You could try to put tech leads and account managers and try to put these gaps between a technical person and the merchant. You can try to put these mm -hmm. buffers in between, but usually, at some point or another, a developer is going to have to talk to a digital marketer or a CDO or a head of digital or, yep. <laughs> or somebody on, on the merchant side. They're going to have to talk to those people. And the challenge becomes then, how do we impress upon someone who thinks that they're just getting paid to be a developer? And they think, I'm not, a, I'm not, a, I'm not an account manager here. I'm not getting paid to talk to a customer. What well, you are, the hard thing is to be able to impress upon a developer the importance and the value that they bring to the table of being able to have those conversations with customers because exactly. they see their value in the amount of code that they put out. But exactly. that's, that, that's actually not the value. It is the experience that they're creating on behalf of the customer that has the value. And unless they intrinsically understand and develop empathy for what the customer is trying to create for their customer, they will never, ever be able to have that, that connection with the merchant. And so these are the kinds of conversations that you have to have the daily with developers in particular, yeah. who might be absolutely amazing at development, front-end development, back-end development, system integration, whatever it might be, whatever their specialization is. But in today's world, especially with AI and co-pilot and everything else, the ability for them to spit out quality code is gonna increase. So in other words, their productivity across pure development is going to increase. But unless their emotional and their human capabilities are increasing at the same rate, they won't be able to bring any unique value to their role. Because coding is now getting to a place where it can almost largely be automated in many respects, and it's going to only yeah. get worse in terms of automation, low-code, no-code platforms, AI-driven coding assistance, et cetera, et cetera. And so I think that the only way for people that are highly technical to continue to matter in the world is for them to lean in more into their humanity, not less. It's to lean into the things that make them human in the first place, and humans still want to have contact with humans. They still want to have conversations with humans. They still want to feel the emotional bond with another human being. And I think that's what we need to be able to teach technical people at scale is to lean into their humanity as opposed to lean into their technical chops, which are going to largely be automated over the next five to 10 years. Exactly. That's one of those things that very often companies don't understand. The development path does not just mean levels that you need to reach to go from medium to higher medium and then to lower senior, then it's, it's not just that. And that's what a lot of companies even today don't understand. Like for a guy to know what he need, where he needed to be to get a certain paycheck, that's not it. He needs to have, first of all, a good understanding of how we are going to cater for his, let's say, development, not just in the segment of technicality and a 
And that's where a lot of companies fail. Like really a lot of companies fail. And then it's very important for people's people's people, let's say that, within companies. And that's also a huge misconception these days. Yeah, we got to develop it. That's it. We're done there. No, man, you're not done there. There's so many things that you're going to continue working on and to make sure that you are all in a good situation because to be able to understand a human, human, this persona on the other side being developer, whichever specialist, somebody needs to be very close to them. Somebody needs to understand what drives them, what's behind them. Same thing as with the client. It's exactly the same thing. So what drives them? What makes sense for him? Is it just a paycheck? Very rarely it's just a paycheck. It's very rarely. Maybe it's a little bit of recognition. Maybe it's a little bit of something else. Make sure you understand what drives him. And then you're managed to get the best out of that guy. And after some time, you just be, uh, the people can blossom. Like even the people that you wouldn't even believe at the beginning. I worked also a lot with developers, with the guys that weren't really weren't into discussing, talking with anybody. Two of them ended up being trainers. It was not only something that I did. It was together with everybody. And so they ended up being trainers. But why? Because we realized that there are things that they're good at, things that we can together work on. And there are things that we should just leave aside. It just It's just not working. But then again, understanding, being compassionate, being close to people and making sure that they develop in a way that works for them as well, not just for the company, then it makes sense. But it's, I'd say it's a lot of these things are done very wrongly in a lot of companies. And that's why they say in, in a lot of situations, yeah, these developers, they sometimes change companies every year. Man, there is something to think about if they are leaving your company every each, every and each of those guys after a year time that there is something to discuss there and to think about that definitely i think that the you cannot expect your team members to have emotional intelligence which is really what we're talking about here is having emotional intelligence and being able to read people and communicate with people in a way that's fulfilling for you and them we cannot expect our teams and our team leaders and the people in the trenches to have emotional intelligence if the leadership doesn't have emotional intelligence exactly it starts from the top the example starts from the top if the tech leads and then the middle managers and the senior managers, nobody comes to an office or a virtual office to be managed. I don't know a single person that wants to be managed, but I know a lot of people that want to be <laughs> exactly. led. I know a lot of people that want to be led and they want to be led by people with high emotional intelligence that actually genuinely care about them as human beings. And I think we have, as leaders, we have to lead by example. We, we cannot expect our technical people to develop their emotional intelligence skills if we're not modeling it for them in the first place. If we treat exactly. hiring them and paying them as just a pure transaction, then that's how good they're going to treat our customers. That's the reality because they're modeling exactly. what the leadership is showing them. So we have to show them, hey, you matter to us as more than just a coder. You matter to us because you are a critical component of our whole organization. And without you, there would be a significant piece missing. And it doesn't matter what your role is. It doesn't matter what your role is. It doesn't matter whether you're a senior, junior, beginner. It doesn't matter. The reality yep. is, is that we are we function as a single organism. And it's like saying, if I lost my pinky finger, that wouldn't matter because it's only just one finger. No, it's a critical part of the whole. And so it doesn't matter from your little toe all the way to your head. Everything is important. Sure, you'll die if you lose your head and you probably won't die if you lose your pinky finger. But I tell you, if you lose your thumb, for example, which is just, again, just one finger and you no longer have a post exactly. thumbs, you're going to feel it. You're going to feel pretty like your life has been altered significantly forever by losing your thigh. Absolutely. And so I think these Absolutely. are the types of conversations we need to be having with people who feel oftentimes, particularly if they are more junior in the organization, it's easy yep. for them to feel expendable. And I think that is what we don't want. We don't want both our customers to feel expendable and that we can just replace exactly. them. And we don't want our teams to feel like they're expendable. And I think that no human likes to feel expendable. Every few human likes to feel like they matter. So I think if we can yep. model that from the top down, then everybody in the organization feels like we're all pulling in the same direction. Exactly. Everybody understanding what's the importance of what they are doing and how that affects everybody. Like every part of every link in that chain matters and it absolutely makes sense. It just needs to be a little bit more, let's say, sometimes explained to people. And for some other people, it works almost like a, they, they do understand it. Mostly people that are more mature and being through different stages of their lives and careers and so on. But as you said, for younger people, not just understanding these things, it's just even constant remote work for younger people is sometimes horrific. I spoke with some of the younger guys, some of the guys that, that gotten like huge paychecks working for companies from Western Europe. But like after a year, they were just like, like a huge company. I don't know, like 800, 900 people, thousand people, but just, they just don't feel it. 
there's the money, everything is there. It's just like they're just a piece of a of this huge a machine. machine. Yeah. Exactly. And and it's problem. But as you said, treating your clients and your employees in the same way, with same dignity, respect, and compassion, I think that's the way to go. And one thing that I really liked, it's not, I'm not trying to promote, obviously I'm not pitching right now. One thing that I really liked when I came here at FIMO and I didn't know about that, basically people do not know about that. Some of our clients do. What was done in FIMO, and it has been like that, I think for a couple of years right now, I think two or three, maybe even four years. NPS as like really the way it was done here, I really love it. So the NPS of the client that, let's say you're working in a production team, NPS of this client that we are working with definitely reflects directly to the bonuses that you're getting, to the bonuses that the teams are getting and so on. So that's a way to kind of not just show you that it, you matter here. You matter because you're a piece of job. Like nobody would probably be able to do it. Maybe somebody, but we want to make you feel like it's just you that can do that. But let's put our mouth, uh, our money where our mouth are. Let's do it in a way that PS is definitely something that is connected with your with your bonuses, with advances, and so on. And they and it's done in a way that that when it's discussed and when we are talking about what happens next, what's your next level, what's the bonus, and so on, everything is very thoroughly discussed. So you know how the people are feeling about that. And I like that part. I like that part very much because they that's additional kind of a connection between a, a client, their satisfaction, and our production teams. It's one of a connection, not the only one and not the most important, but definitely I think it makes sense. Everybody is saying to their customer centricity and all that, but it's just so overused. In all honesty, that it's like really a question like what is behind that? How do you put it in practice? I'll tell you the other thing that I think agencies should all be doing and I see very few doing is run internal NPS across all of their team members. And instead of, <laughs> instead of asking, so on the merchant <clears throat> side or on the customer side, you'd be saying, would you recommend us on a scale of one to 10, 10 being absolutely and, one, and zero being no, we never would. Would you recommend us to someone else as a service provider? Internally, the question is, would you recommend us as an employer? That is the crux. So you need to be running NPS on your internal teams. And if there's a massive divergence, or let's put it this way, the bigger the divergence between your internal NPS score and your external NPS scores will tell you what your churn rate of staff is likely to be. Exactly. So the more closely aligned your internal NPS and your external NPS are, the lower, your, uh, uh, of course, over a certain minimum threshold. If you're shit on yeah. the outside, you're likely to be shit on the inside. But over a certain threshold, the more closely aligned your internal and your external NPS is, that directly correlates to your churn rate of staff and customers. So I think Agreed. that a lot of service agencies that are dealing with customers on a daily basis, they have to be looking at internal NPS. They have to do it. And even some of the largest retailers that I work with, they run NPS internally and they look at the trend over time. And they look at that as a guide to how good of an employer they are or that they think they are. Because a lot of times when you run internal NPS, because at the top level of management, no, we're a great, we've got relatively low churn. We're a great employer. Everybody loves working for us. Run NPS and find out. Run anonymous exactly. internal NPS and find out. Put your money where your mouth exactly. is with your customers and with your staff. Exactly. We are doing it. It has been, I think, also a couple of years, two, three, four years that we are doing it. And it's working miracles for us because some things that you are maybe not even aware of simply like surface out. And then basically, it's always obviously an anonymous one. And they, yeah, I think it's absolutely needed. There is like literally no way not to do it. There, there are literally, I'd say everybody should be doing it for sure. But it's not the norm these days. It's not the norm for sure. No, it's definitely not. Listen, mate, Z, it has been fantastic chatting with you. It's the first yep. time I've had you on with a call and it's been amazing chatting with you. I've learned a lot and it's been a fantastic conversation. And I really hope that we get to, we get a chance to chat again. If you'd like to get mentored by Jason for free, head over to greenwoodconsulting.net, scroll to the bottom of the page, and click Get Mentored by Jason.